we covered what God had done, but God is moving us on. And I, it's interesting they mentioned upper room because that's exactly what the Lord, you know, the upper room kind of kind of tends to what God did and how he birthed the church. And it was an upper room of people, 120. There was a lot of people that had been exposed to Jesus, but there's only 120 that were waiting for him. And uh, it was 120 in one accord, in one spirit, that changed the world. But it was birthed with small, a small number. And I, and I feel like we're in another, another Kairos. Well, I'm going to get into that, actually. Let me start here. Kairos moment. This is what I feel the Lord's saying right now. We are in, in this is a Greek word in the Bible. And it's, it's the word is Kairos. I don't know if any of you have heard that before. And we are right now, this nation... His people are in a Kairos moment. And it means this is a very opportune time. And um, it's a special time. And there's different times it's used in Scripture. I'm going to read one, one passage. Second Corinthians 6, 1 Corinthians 6.1, it says, Now because we are fellow workers, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, I heard you at an acceptable kairos time, and in the day of salvation I helped you. Now, Look now is the acceptable time, the kairos time. Look, now is the day of salvation. You know what? It's so easy to see what the enemy has been doing in this last season. This church was birthed in a, in a time of crisis. But that crisis has not gone away. It's just gone. It's, it's morphing and it's changing. And we still have a sleepy church. But the Lord is waking up a remnant. And for those, in, you know, in the book of Revelation, when Jesus comes to the seven churches, it says over and over, for him who has ears to hear, let him hear. And it's time that we have ears to hear. And it's it's and so in a Kairos moment, little decisions matter the most. It, and it's, so I, I encourage us today that we recognize, you know, that we talk about the Issachar anointing. They know the times and the seasons. And it's we as a little body of believers, I believe where we're, there's going to be great shift and change in the, in the coming months. Um, I'm processing some of that. But... Uh, the Lord is, is calling us to wake up because unfortunately when COVID came and all that stuff, the church was asleep. And I went to an event recently where these, all these doctors stood, stood amongst their peers with everything to lose and nothing to gain. And they stood up for truth and they knew the truth when even their, when even their uh, peers were that knew better would were quiet. And I was moved, but you know, what's interesting there was only one pastor there represented, uh, Archer. And that should grieve us. That should move us. And uh, in a way that, why is that? Because, you know, the Lord, you know, the church has so many critics, but not many intercessors. So many, so many critics, but not many watchmen. And, um, I feel I believe what, what the Lord in the season he's doing right now is he's he's cleansing his church. He wants he's calling us to be a family. And I think, you know, with talking about Ken and different people, he's calling us to be a family and uh, not and, and, and not a dysfunctional or abusive family and a family that's filled with fathers and mothers, a people that turn from victims to overcomers. And. Um, you know, Paul, Paul. Paul to the Philippians, and he, even in the early church, the birth of the church, even his own churches were turning against him and not recognizing him as a father. And he 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 grieved because he said he was he, to the he was writing to the Philippians. He's like, I'm sending Timothy to you because I only trust him because I, I'm afraid. How did he, what does he say exactly? He says, uh, Philippians two twenty one. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Christ. All others care only for themselves and not what matters for Jesus Christ. And so I just feel that this season we're in right now, the Lord is, he's, he's, he's been, well, as a body here, he's been stripping us down and he's been cleansing us because 
I believe this Kairos moment, we're at, the, we're at, in it talks in the scripture, we're at the end, it talks about a great harvest. And the Lord, is, the Lord, you know, the church is waiting on, much of the church is waiting on God when God's waiting on us. And we're waiting on something. And God's like, I'm waiting on you guys to become a family, to let the Lord do the deep pruning work. And so that I can, you know, an upper room type gathering where they're in one accord. They're not, it's not a superficial unity, but it's, you know, and it's an accord based on not building something, but an affection for the Lord. And um, if the Lord can make his family a safe place, then he can bring in the harvest of souls. And I, and I just testify today, you know, the harvest is ripening and we can look at all the evil things that's going on in the world, but I tell you, it, it's through the great shaking that the Lord prepares a harvest. You can read it through in the book of Revelation. It's the shaking, the judgments of God. You know, it's interesting. We talked about Jesus and God as all these different things. He's judge, he's father, he's this, he's that. But in the book of Revelation, the, the ending of the age, and it, opens, it talks about opening up the scrolls of judgment that will bring an end to this age and, and, a, and, the, and the beginning of a new age without death and destruction and sin. God, the Holy Spirit, is 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 contending with his church that we would be ready so that we could bring in the harvest and end this age because he doesn't want the cycle of sin and death to continue on forever and ever. And it's but it's the key is is in the shaking and the judgments and all the things that are going on in the world. He says the love of many will grow cold and lose their understanding of what's going on. But it's interesting, it's it, Jesus, the Lamb of God. It's Jesus as Lamb that opens the scrolls of judgment. And, it's, and Jesus came from the Father to represent God to us as a sacrificial lamb. See, before Christ came, we didn't know who God was mysterious. Even to Moses, there was an element of mystery. David was a forerunner, and he, saw, he was the first to see God as a father. But then Jesus came, and what did John the Baptist say when he saw us? Behold the Lamb of God. And it's in this day that God is looking for a people that possess, not only they have a deep understanding of God as the sacrificial lamb. And if we if we walk in this world as believers and we, and we see the shaking going on and we don't see that there's the lamb of God, the one who's willing to come as a servant and lay down his life for us and, and realize that there's purpose in the shaking. And there's purpose in the shaking in our lives. And there's purpose even now in the shaking right now in the church. There's division and God slander because he's stripping us down. He's trying to make us a safe family and he's calling forth the and paul said and he grieved in the early church he says you have so many teachers but so few fathers and a father is not protecting their turf but they're willing to lay down their life for their children and so the lord's inviting us each one of us to engage with his body to become a family and to become a father and if you call to a, whatever church you're called to don't there don't don't go there looking what can it do for me but go lord how can i lay down my life for the people here and that's when you'll start to see that the river of life that he promised you will start flowing in your life. And, um, you know, this week, the harvest is ripe. Like I was on a job and there was uh, just paint. I'm a painter by trade. And there was a carpet guy there. And, um, you know, I usually put headphones in and I'm in my own space. But I felt a little nudge. I'm like, you know what? Just and this, I usually just, you know, like it's easy. I'm kind of an introvert and it's easy just to kind of be in your own world. And the world's becoming more that way as the love of many grow cold and Darkness fills the earth and hatred and racism. There's just a coldness coming on people. You know, and we if you saw what happened in Vancouver the other day and this guy getting stabbed, and it was so great in my heart at the indifference of everyone around him. No one dare stood over him or told, you know, they just all oh, cowards. And it says the cowards will have their place in the lake of fire. And the Lord's looking for courageous people in the church. You know, it's not just doctors, but he's looking for people, he's looking for Christians who are teachers. You know, they have no problem teaching certain things in schools, but Christians are shy and scared because they don't want to lose their job. What happened to we willing to lose our lives for the sake of the truth? When the Amen. world is willing to lose their life for their agenda, it's time that the church stood up. But first we need, we need to come and gather at the upper room because the early church was not ready to be a witness until the power came from on high. And it said there was the spirit that came on the early church there was a reverential awe, and God did notable miracles. You know, we can get really, as Christians, we can get really into activism, and that has its place. But God, you know, if you look at the early church, God would shift whole cities and regions when it had a few people that were sold out to the Lord, that were clothed in power from on high. And God would do notable miracles among them, and it would change whole cities. And if you study revivals throughout history, they always had a remnant that would come out to the Lord and wholehearted, and a core group of people 
that would shake the heavens with their prayers and God would change the atmosphere? What if revival broke out in schools for one teacher just saying, I've had enough and I don't care if I lose my job, but I'm going to preach the gospel and I'm going to be the gospel in my classroom. Just one or two people in one place, you can make the difference. And there has to be this fire come back to the church where we're not afraid of man. Amen. We're not afraid. We're not afraid of what they might do. Jesus promised us that they would hate us for the truth and the love of the truth. And it says in the last days, many would have a form of godliness, but deny the power. And we must not, and you know, it's just they would be, he defined the falling away as ones who are lovers of themselves. And we must be, take heed to the gospel that is preached. Is it preaching a gospel that is a love with yourself and your own needs? Or is it a love for God and for the harvest? And so we must examine our own hearts and say, what gospel have I come to? Have I come to pick up my cross and follow the Lord wherever it is? And lay down my life. And so one of the things the Lord, he wants to bring in is the harvest. And, you know, oh yeah, I, I got off sidetrack. So I was saying, like an example, I, this week I was just on this job. And loving my own life, I was working, focusing on my job and making money. And the Lord stepped aside and said, hey, why don't you just start talking to the carpet guy? Within five minutes, he's talking about his life and how the COVID, like COVID's messed him up. And he knows there's a God and he knows there's a devil now because of what the enemy's been doing. <laughs> and there's people coming to God because they see that they can't deny that there's a devil now. <laughs> And I know, like, my parents on Sunday, they were, or whatever it was, two-hour conversation. Someone just, it's like a fish jumping in the boat. They want to know God. And so we need to get out of our own heads. And we need to get in love with Jesus so that when people come to us, we have something to share. And we're not ashamed of the gospel. And what is the gospel? The gospel is an exchange of life, our life for his life. Jesus becoming our life. Jesus not a means to an end. Jesus not making our, not, he didn't die on the cross to make our lives better. He died on the cross that he could become our life. And that's the gospel that's going to be preached to the corners, four corners of the earth. Not a prosperity gospel, not a prosperity gospel, not a gospel that makes my life better and more comfortable. God, God knows he needs to make our lives more uncomfortable. Because if you look at the Western church, we've been so comfortable and privileged. We become the Laodicean church, as it talks about, where we think we can see, but we're blind. We think we can hear, but we're deaf. Because it says, Jesus said that the church is the salt of the earth. And in ancient times, the salt was the preservative of the culture. It was preserving righteousness in the earth. And so if we look at Canada today, we can, we can look at all the sin and death and destruction, and we can put it at the feet of the church. Because we have not been the salt or the light. And the Lord is coming to his church with the sword of his mouth. And he's saying, repent. Consider your ways. And I just pray that the Lord, I just feel him. He's, prov he's been provoking me. I'm not saying I'm on any pedestal. But he's calling us. He's calling us to, you know, I remember driving around Abbotsford. And I've said this a few times. Bear with me. But, you know, it's church buildings on every corner. And I said, Lord, why is there so many church buildings? That it seems like such a waste of resources when there's so much need, but we got 100 church buildings with 100 different denominations. And he said, it's because they don't want me in their homes. And so we must not compartmentalize God to a part of our life where we go up one day a week because the early church met daily, house to house, because there was a passion and a fire and, an and, a and it was a measure of the glory of the Lord amongst them in measure. In fact, so much that... Peter's shadow and it would heal people as they walk by and it's this kind of power we need because we're facing unprecedented levels of darkness in the earth and there has to be an equal and opposite light and glory upon his church for once again and that's only going to happen if we get hungry because the Lord does not come to those who casually seek him he's looking for the earnest seeker he says if you search for me with all of your heart you will find me not on Sunday morning or not in a service. Some of us, you know, Daniel, speaking of 80-year-olds today, Daniel was 84, 80-ish, 83, 84. He single-handedly prayed Israel out of Babylon. One man who said, he said he fasted and sought the Lord and sought to understand. And the Lord's looking for Daniels. So if you're 80, God's looking for you too. It could be the best and finest hour of your life. 
And when we go to your funeral, what will they say? Mm -hmm. I was a man who sought the Lord with my whole heart. And when you get to heaven and stand before him, you'll say, what was your life all about? What was the motives of your heart? It's a Joel 2 call. The Lord is not, you know, he's wanting to birth something in us. And he's, he's aims to provoke us, not to fill our minds with knowledge or hype our souls with a fancy speech. He's provoking awakening in people's spirits to take hold of the kingdom and take hold of the deepest places of his heart. To secure an inheritance for him in the earth, a people who carry divine burden. And he will do that by provoking people through great need in their own families and situations. If, he can get a, if we can get a hold of his burden for those right in front of us, he will then graduate you for a burden for the nations. And it's through travail of birthing, he, we will prevail. All activities among his people must cease until it's driven by divine burden. Mm. Come to the altar of worship and prayer, the tabernacle of David. Jesus grieved over the temple, and he's grieving over his church today. And he said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And I declare to you today that this, the Lord is calling his people now to, a, to, a, to gather, corporate gatherings of worship and prayer, to get his heart and then minister back to him. And it's, you know, David was a forerunner. He took the, he took the Ark of the Covenant and he took away the veils and he ministered and he worshiped and prayed. And it was, you know, and it's, it's a shot. It's a, it's a type of the heavenly throne. In the heavenly throne room, there is worship and prayer intermingled. And I, I you know, I believe the Lord right now with this body of people here, good Lord, I, he's, he's already doing it, but he's going to increase it. There's going to be regional gatherings of calling the people, the people that are hungry and thirsty for the Lord. They're not content with their mediocre lives. To come and gather in corporate gatherings to seek the face of God and to, to, to change the spiritual atmosphere. Because, you know, we can protest and do freedom rallies, but we have weapons that we do not know yet. And he says, our weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. And it's time there gets the people that get a hold of these weapons. And, you know, Satan's okay with a few healings here and there, but he's looking to transform the nations because he has a harvest he wants. He wants a harvest out of Canada. He wants a harvest out of the youth and the LGBTQ. He has a harvest, but he's looking for harvesters who are possessed with the fire of God, who walk in anointing and not full of themselves and full of their own great ideas, but have emptied themselves and be filled with the Lord so that the, earth, the, the people and the nations of the earth would say, God is among them. God is with them. There would be an awe and a fear of the Lord and people not dare curse his name because it would mean something again. And he's looking for people that care, that care about him, that care about his name, that they grieve when they hear his name cursed, when the church is mocked, because it's rightfully mocked, because it's got no power. We preach, oh, you shouldn't do this, this, and lifestyle, but we have no power to deliver them from the lifestyle. And if we could just get on our face and stop all our activities and just cry out to him, if you could just get a people on their face, hungry and desperate for him, maybe he would come down again like he did in Acts 2 with fire and power and possess us within a measure we have not known. But first we must be stirred. And that's what this message is today. It's a provoke. I'm here to provoke you to get in your bedroom and cry out to the Lord. Until you get some fire. Until when you share the gospel, people tremble. That your words have power on them. They're not empty words of a God you barely know. Hallelujah. Preach it, brother. Amen. Yeah. How do you end that? Let's end it with some worship. Bless you guys. I just felt that was the burden of the Lord I had to release. And it's not pointed at anyway. It's pointed at me because the Lord's provoking me. He's saying more. I want more of you, Matt. Don't look at, to the left and right of what you think is wholehearted. He said, the Bible says, don't compare yourselves amongst each other. Because what if everyone around you is lukewarm? And I haven't seen anyone yet. You know, I've studied church history. I've studied the great revivalists. And some of us, need, you know, that, that can provoke you. It's like, man, this man walked with God like I've never seen and it produces a poverty in spirit. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit. And the Lord, you know, the church, the church thinks, the Laodicean church thinks they're rich. We must come to the point where we see we're poor, Lord. We're poor without you. And, if, and it's in that posture 
that he can fill and continue. And that poverty of spirit never leaves us. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an element for growth in the Lord. It's well, Lord, I need more of you. Lord, I need you to fill me with more of you. And, and, and it's, it never stops. And it's like the altar of incense day and night and night and day. Let incense arise. And so the Lord's building his tabernacle of David again in his church. And once again, Jesus will hopefully say, my house is a house of prayer for all nations. Amen. Bless you guys.